Hello, this is another video that I'm doing on a series on the Bible as literature. And today I want to talk about several uh, special topics related to the Bible as literature on the genres of proverbs, yearbooks, and treaties. Let's talk about proverbs first. If you have a Bible and you've read an introduction or something, you've probably seen that some of the middle books in the Bible are classified as wisdom literature. And maybe that's meaningful to you, but I suspect that most people, when they see that, don't know exactly what that means. And honestly, I'm not sure it's the most meaningful category anyway, because the books which are called wisdom literature are all really, they're a little different as far as the type of literature that they are. So I just want to talk, first of all, about Proverbs by itself. A proverb is an example of this uh, proverb here, 10.1. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. Now, the book of Proverbs itself is really divided up into sections. Chapters 1 through 9, they talk about wisdom. They're not really Proverbs. They're not individual Proverbs. It's mostly the benefits of wisdom and warning against immorality is what's common in chapters one through nine. It's in chapters 10, beginning in 10, one, and then going through 22, 16, that those are called the Proverbs of Solomon. And those are all Proverbs and they are all couplets. In other words, just two lines make up the proverb. And they each one of them stands alone. So this is like the one example you have in the Bible where it's context free. One of the most basic principles of interpreting and understanding a passage in scripture is to look at the overall context. Well, this is the exception because each individual proverb doesn't have anything to do with the one that came before or afterwards in this section of Proverbs. Like you look at these first two Proverbs a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. So that's the first proverb. You can see it's a couplet. It's got two lines. But then you look at the next one. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. And that really doesn't have anything to do with the first one. I mean, you could probably make something up. But as you go, go through one by one, you realize that each one of these proverbs stands all alone. Now, what is a proverb, really? Proverbs are not the same as laws, and they're also not the same as promises. And this is probably important for us when we read them so that we don't incorrectly interpret what we're reading. Uh, proverbs are sometimes maxims that, are, that tend to be true, but they don't mean it's, it's not like it's a law, it's not like it's a promise. He, here's a proverb that's in a couplet form that we know that's not in the Bible. Early to bed and early to rise, make a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. So is that always true? No. I mean, probably good advice, and it'll help. Uh, but it, it's not always true. And it's the same thing with the Proverbs in the Bible. We just looked at this one already. A wise son makes a glad father but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. So is that always true? No, it's usually true. Uh, but you can certainly have a case where if you had a fiercely unbelieving father and mother and the son became a believing Christian or something, that would be a wise son, but it might upset his parents. Uh, so a proverb like Proverbs 10.1, that's something that tends to be true but it's not always true. And now I'm going to go to the verse which is gonna make people go thumbs down on this video. So sorry about that, but same is true with this one. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, I think this is probably one of the favorite Bible verses of parents, because it seems to imply that if you raise your child right, that when he gets old, he will be you know, faithful to the way that you raised him. Only thing is, it's not a promise. I wish it was, but it's not. 
And uh, maybe it should be actually an encouragement that it's not because there's some parents who've raised a child, a child has seemed to have gone the wrong way and then they grieve over it. But th that doesn't mean that they did it wrong. Um, it's just that this is something that tends to be true, but it's not always. Another example, just same chapter, if you want to back up two verses, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honors in life. Not always true. Sometimes Proverbs give moral instructions. As a matter of fact, they usually do in one way or the other. Like, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. Now, not all of the Proverbs in the book of Proverbs take that form. The uh, beginning in chapter 22, verses 17, and going on for about two and a half chapters, there's a section called Words of the Wise, and those Proverbs are not all couplets. They're multiverse Proverbs. And then in uh, 25, you have five more chapters, which are called the Proverbs of Solomon that came down via the man of Hezekiah, indicating really that this book of Proverbs is a compilation of things which had been written earlier. And so uh, these are mostly couplets, but unlike the earlier part, these actually have some context. One tends to connect to the next. And then the last two chapters are three different sections, the words of Agur, the words from King Lemuel, and then there's the virtuous woman passage. So that's basically it on Proverbs. So now let's talk about Chronicles. If you've read Chronicles and seen the introduction, you've probably seen this classified in part of the Bible that are, that are called the historical books. And it is historical. However, I wouldn't say that it belongs to the literary genre of history. We have a genre that fits it a little bit better than that. And believe it or not, the genre is, it's a yearbook. Chronicles is more like a yearbook than a history book. You know, a yearbook that you had if you went to high school and your high school or your college produces a yearbook, that's kind of what Chronicles is. It'll certainly give you some of the history of your year at school, but it's not really the same as a history book. For one thing, in a yearbook or in a school newspaper or a local newspaper, you're taught as a journalist to put names, names, and more names, as many names as you can possibly get in there because you know, if you put a kid's name in there who scored a goal on the soccer team, his parents will buy five copies of the newspaper. And I don't know that they were buying copies of the book of Chronicles, but it has the same feature that it put in the book about as many names as could possibly be put in there, uh, mostly in the genealogical passages. Chronicles focuses on Judah. So if you compare it with First and Second Kings, it has a lot of the same history, and it even seems to have drawn from a literary standpoint from First and Second Kings, but it mostly leaves out the things that are related to the northern kingdom of Israel. So Chronicles doesn't have anything about the very famous passages about Elijah and Elisha and some of the other things about the northern kingdom of Israel. It emphasizes a really heavy emphasis on the wonderful worship experiences that they had during Israel's history. And it's doing that because it's trying to encourage people to, to worship the Lord. And the way the Chronicles actually ends, it's trying to encourage the exiles who, are, who had to leave the land of Judah to return and build and live in the land of Judah in Jerusalem and resume worshiping the Lord. The negative stories, which you find in First and Second Samuels and First and Second Kings, are some of them, really kind of a lot of them are left out. Even some of the very famous ones like David and Bathsheba, it's not in there at all. And the reason is because that's not the purpose of the book. It's a yearbook. And a yearbook doesn't tell all the bad things that happened in school. It's to give you good memories of the school. And then Chronicles also does some interesting things that yearbooks tend to do. Here you have the middle of a, um, I didn't even put the, the verse references here, but I think this is 1 Chronicles 16, and it's a, a genealogy. 
But in the middle of the genealogy, you have this part that I put in red, and it's the prayer of Jabez. That's kind of become famous. Somebody wrote a book on it, whatnot. But the thing that I would like to point out about that is not only is this just stuck there in the middle of the genealogy as a sort of decoration, but Jabez is not in the genealogy. You know, he's not one of the ones that was fathered, and he's not the father of anybody going on. It just is is put in there to decorate the the passage there in the genealogy. And here's another example. First Chronicles 16. Uh, I guess the Jabez wasn't in First Chronicles 16. It was a little earlier. In First Chronicles 16, they bring the Ark of God into Jerusalem, and David sets it up there, and they're celebrating and offering burnt offerings and worshiping the Lord. And then in verse 8, it starts in with this prayer of psalm of praise. And so give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, and it has about 15 verses, which are the same as Psalm 105, and also it's taken from Psalm 96 and 106. Now, a couple things to say about that. First of all, those are actually not Davidic Psalms. If you if you go and read uh, in, in the book of Psalms, they're not assigned to David. And based on what they say, you would kind of conclude that they might have been exilic or post-exilic Psalms written later than David. And I think that they probably were. Uh, so why does it show up here? Well, once again, it's a Psalm of praise to the Lord that is decorating and celebrating this thing. It doesn't say that David, David was the one that spoke the psalm. It's just placed there as a psalm of praise and worship to the Lord. So that's an interesting thing about Chronicles, and it might help us to understand it a little bit more. Now, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy may be the most famous book in the law. It's, it's almost the most totally law-like book in the law but it's actually structured as a suzerainty treaty. Now, people wonder, what in the world is that? So what that is, is it's a second millennium BC treaty between two unequal parties. In other words, it's a treaty where one part is one party is the, gonna be the Lord and the other party is a vassal. So it'd be like normally two kingdoms and one has subjugated the other and they've signed a treaty where the one has to agree to obey the other. But in the book of Deuteronomy, Yahweh is the Lord and Israel is the vassal. If you want to read a little bit more about it there, I referenced the book that I wrote dating the Old Testament, but you could also, if you don't have that, you could Google the treaty between Mersili and Duppy Tessab. And I'm sure you'll have to pause the video if you want to do that because you will never remember those names. But that will give you a little bit of information of an example of a suzerainty treaty. And what they do is they follow a certain outline. These treaties will have a preamble, historical background, stipulations of the treaty, invocation of witnesses, a deposition of a written copy, and then curses and blessings. And this is the outline that all these treaties follow. And interestingly enough, Deuteronomy does the same thing. The preamble is right there at the beginning of the book. And then after the first five verses, there's a historical review of where all Israel traveled and what they did. And then beginning in chapter four and going through most of the book, that's the treaty stipulations. We think of that as the law, and it is, but that's the, the stipulations of the treaty, the way that this is organized. There's two different passages where they call the witnesses, and then there's a deposition of a written copy, and then in chapter 28, there's the curses and blessings chapter. You might have thought it was a little strange, maybe when you were reading the book of Deuteronomy, if you ever read through the Bible, that you had a whole chapter uh, dedicated to curses and blessings, but that's the way these treaties were done in that day and age. And I'm not going to go through examples of each one of those sections. You can read them yourself, except I did want to do, just look at one because I thought it was interesting. 
when you have these invocation of witnesses and these other treaties, the witnesses, they always call as the witnesses all these gods and goddesses. Well, in the Bible, you certainly couldn't do that because there would be false gods and false goddesses and it would be evil to call upon them. So instead, what it does is it says in Deuteronomy 30, 19, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. So it does invoke witnesses, but the witnesses are not a series of gods. The witnesses are heaven and earth. So when you go to the book of the prophets, the first in the book of the prophets is the book of Isaiah. At this time, Israel has been unfaithful. They have not obeyed the law. So what happens? This is the way the book of Isaiah begins in verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children I have reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. So you see, Isaiah is calling the witnesses, the ones who had witnessed the law, and he's calling them to witness against Israel. So anyway, that's what I've got as far as uh, uh, treaty, Deuteronomy and treaty form. That's three different types of genres that are special genres in the Bible. We've got a few more, and I'll plan to do some of them in the uh, in a later section. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed this one, and I'll look forward to presenting another another one for you soon.